Chapter 29 The View from the Bench Things turn out best for the people who make the best of the way things turn out. John Wooden Okay, so you suck. Or at least your coach thinks you kind of suck right now. Maybe you're injured, or maybe you're deep in a slump and need time on the pine to help you think on your sins. Perhaps it's just your time to sit so that everyone gets their innings and stays sharp. No matter the reason for landing on the bench, and certainly not all reasons are because you did something wrong, there's a code of conduct to live up to, things to do and not do. I spent a lot of time on the bench, nearly five years due to all my injuries combined, along with other stints when I wasn't playing well. I'm grateful for it, and I want you to know what it can do for you, too. The Bench as Life Coach One year when I was coaching high school summer ball, our star player had a knee injury and was sitting out for an entire month. It was the first time he'd ever sat the bench, and to this day, it's still unlikely he sat out much, if at all, for performance reasons. The injury was beyond his control, but his behavior on the bench was not. I quickly started to notice him, which is not what you want. He was having conversations that were too loud, was laughing too hard, and too often was on the bench when everyone else was standing up on the rail, leaning in and watching. Everything about his body language screamed, I'm not physically able to play, so I'm not mentally here either. A few weeks later, when one of our least effective pitchers was pitching with the bases loaded and really struggling, I found him rolling around on the bench while everyone else was on the rail, cheering on their teammate who really needed the encouragement. It was the last straw. Me. Hey, what's the score right now? Him. Uh, I'm not sure. Me. What's the count? Him. I'm not sure. Me. Get out of my dugout. Your teammate is out there battling for his life, and you don't even care. You don't deserve to be in here. Go sit with your parents. Why did I do this? Well, because I had been there, and a coach had put me in my place in the same way 12 or 13 years prior. It was a valuable experience, and my coach was 100% right in chewing me out. I think it was my sophomore year in college because I was on the cusp of cracking into the starting rotation. Because I was so close to getting something I had coveted for a year and a half, a slot in the rotation, I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to pitch well when I got my chances. One day, I had a rough start and got the hook early. I let out a deep sigh of disappointment as I handed my coach the ball and walked off the mound to the dugout. I gave the obligatory high fives as I stomped down the dugout steps, then sat my glove down on the bench, threw on my jacket, sat down, and looked at my feet. A moment later, my coach was right in front of me. Dan, look at me right now. I was scared. You're not going to sit down here and pout, play this woe is me game. Your team is still out there, and you've got two options. Get up and go cheer for the pitcher who is bailing you out, or get out of the dugout. Which is it going to be? It was the only game I'd have to be told that, though there would certainly be other games when all I wanted to do was sulk, pout, whine, or hide after coming out of a game. Many nights, I felt I both needed and deserved a moment to myself to just feel the crappy feeling of pitching badly. But no. As soon as I left the game, my teammates were furiously trying to undo the damage I had done. I owed them better. They had been cheering for me as I pitched, and I needed a moment to ignore all of them and focus on how badly I felt? Nope. Get up. Go to the rail and watch. Clap and yell when they get the outs I couldn't get. Stop being a baby. If you're not a big rah-rah guy, fine. I wasn't either. I did a hundred times more silent watching than I did excited cheering. I was not the team chatterbox. But no matter your personality, you can go fold your arms over the dugout rail or lean against the fence and watch. It's a gesture of appreciation, if nothing else, showing that you'll continue to be present with your guys as they finish the fight. Plus, it's hard. It's a challenge in any situation to control your negative emotions and bring yourself back to place your focus on others. You have to help pick up the pieces however you can and support those who are going to put them back together for you. That moment in the dugout 
looking into my coach's angry eyes, has served me well for the 15 years that followed, and I hope some coach chews you out for it, too. No eyewash, please. When stuck on the bench, the most important thing is to not give up on your routine or work. If anything, work harder and be somewhat visible about it. Lots of players, when benched, sulk, pout, and give up. They don't go through their normal routines or habits because they think, I'm not playing, so why should I bother? I'll take the day off. This is the absolute best way to ensure you don't get back on the field anytime soon. What coaches want is to see their bench players focused and putting in the same, if not more, preparation to be ready when they're called. If the coach sees you and thinks to himself, okay, Johnny looks like he's ready to play, they won't hesitate to get you back in the lineup when the right moment arrives. Yet, be sure your motives are true. Don't work hard just because it's what coach wants to see. Do it because it's truly the thing that will get you back into the lineup for good. We have a term for fake hustle in baseball. Eyewash means to whitewash the eyes that are watching you. You know it when you see it or when you do it. Looking busy, hustling more, or putting in more practice only when coaches or scouts are around. Don't be an eyewash guy. We all land on the bench sometimes, but your path back into a starting role is paved with hard work and mental preparation so that you're ready to pounce on your next opportunity. Be ready when your moment comes. Is today the day that your starting left fielder gets stuck in traffic and doesn't show up until the third inning? Is today the day that the starting catcher takes a foul tip to the hand and will be in a cast for the next month? Is today the day that your team's ace pitcher gets hammered early and the team needs five good relief innings out of you? You never want your teammates to suffer, but you never know when something unexpected might vault you back into the starting lineup. If you play well enough, that spot in the lineup might be yours to keep. Now, coaches always balance hopes for the future with what they see today. You might go two for two at the plate, but they still don't see you as being the guy for the remaining 80 games of the season. Even if Mike Trout rolls his ankle and some minor leaguer is called up and goes 12 for 20 with four homers in his five games until Mike is healthy again, Mike Trout is still going back in the lineup. They might find another spot for the minor leaguer, but it may not be permanent quite yet. There's give and take, and the body of work a player puts in determines his future much more than just one single game, inning, or at bat. If you've been reliable for three seasons, you're not going to be replaced just because you had one bad game and your replacement hit two dingers. And you probably know this. You've been on the bench at some point just to play great when you get a chance, then find yourself right back on the bench. But you never know what might happen if you seize an opportunity, so you have to keep your head high no matter what. Chris Taylor, the 2020 World Series champion infielder with the Los Angeles Dodgers, began his sophomore year at the University of Virginia as the starting right fielder, which was not his chosen position. When the opening day starting shortstop injured his hamstring early that season, Taylor was moved to short. When that opening day starter eventually healed up and was ready to return, the job was no longer his. Taylor was too good there, and he stuck. After that, he led Virginia to a College World Series appearance and was chosen the following season in the fifth round of the MLB draft. Stories like this are really common, but players only capitalize on opportunities when they're ready to do so. Sure, Taylor wasn't on the bench, he was playing right field, but he could have sulked and taken himself out of it mentally, upset that he wasn't in the infield where he belonged. Instead, he was ready. He played to the best of his ability when the job at shortstop unexpectedly opened up. On the other side of it, this is a cautionary tale for when you sit the bench for any reason. If you don't put in the work while you're hurt, doing everything you can to be as good as possible as soon as you're back, your position may not be waiting for you. No matter how good you are, what have you done for me lately is a sentiment shared by coaches everywhere. Yes, a good track record counts for a lot, but you also can't coast on that forever. Stay hungry, work hard, and don't let go once you've earned your way into the starting nine. Can't read the label from inside the bottle. 
If you find yourself on the bench for poor performance, no matter the reason, it's a good time to take a quick moment to ask yourself, how good am I really? What could I improve on? Which aspects of my game are still not where they need to be? Is your self-evaluation of your strengths and weaknesses accurate? Do your parents tell you that you're really good, but results maybe don't quite align? Having some swagger and a thick suit of mental armor is critical. You do need to insulate yourself from slumps and hecklers by being cocky about your ability. Confidence is everything in baseball, and you can't be second-guessing yourself. Yet, you also need to be realistic about why you're struggling and why you've found yourself on the bench. Often, we're not good self-evaluators, nor are those who love us. Your parents might not have a clue about where you actually fit in, in the grand scheme of baseball, and you might think your time on the bench is completely unwarranted. The saying goes, you can't read the label from the inside of the bottle. This means that when you're too close to something, you can't see it for what it really is. If you're not getting the playing time you want, seek out an honest evaluation from someone you trust. Maybe it's a teammate or coach who will be brutally honest with you if you ask him to be. Pull someone aside or ask for a private meeting to discuss what you can improve on to win back your spot. If you never were a starter, learning what your weaknesses are will help you fill them in and climb the ladder faster. Getting honest feedback, even when it stings, is one of the best things you can do to stop moving backward and begin moving forward. Ultimately, communicating well with gatekeepers like coaches is one of the best skills you can learn. You'll need it at every level in baseball and with all your relationships and job opportunities in life. As a coach myself, I wanted my players to take the initiative to ask for help and feedback. I hoped they'd show me that they weren't content sitting on the bench or playing in a role that wasn't their first choice. If you want something better for yourself, most of the time in life, you have to both work for it and ask for it. One of the two is usually not enough. If you don't want to be on the bench, take the necessary steps to make real, tangible progress. But while you're there, remember that the darkest part of night is always closest to dawn, and riding the pine can make you a better player and person in the long run.